Hey, it's Tobin. I've done a number of screencasts and blog posts about different performance things I've been trying related to GeoPortal. And that journey's come to an end. I've done everything I'm going to be doing on performance. So I thought a retrospective on the different things I did and how they affected performance and some lessons learned sort of stuff was in order. So let's jump right into it. First thing I'll say has nothing to do with performance, and that's accessibility. And I am pleased as punch that GeoPortal has zero accessibility violations using the Axe testing tool, which is the best tool I've found. Now that isn't, to, to do perfect accessibility testing, if there is such a thing, you do automated tests and then you do a bunch of manual tests. I, I'm just talking about the automated tests. But zero errors, that's extremely rare. Uh, even the W3C's page on their accessibility guidelines, which is more or less just a wall of text, even it has accessibility violations. So having zero errors is extremely rare. The bugaboo for most of my errors were contrast issues, where say this color or icon, icon color didn't have enough contrast with the background. So people with visual disabilities would have a hard time with that. Fixing all the X errors, I mean, you, you look at your list of errors, you know, just these long lists and you think, this is gonna be awful. Really wasn't bad at all. Something I encourage everybody to do. All right, put that aside. Uh, performance. The first thing I did is I converted the site from HTTP to HTTPS and HTTP2. HTTPS is required for different things like uh, service workers, progressive web apps, uh, even the geolocation API, at least for Chrome, needs to be over HTTPS. And you're going HTTPS anyway. You don't want people doing a man-in-the-middle attack on your site or somebody on some Comcast router that's going to put ads on your page for you. So that was totally worth it, and that was very... Well, it was fairly straightforward. I used the GeoPortals on a DigitalOcean droplet with Linux and Nginx. I used Let's Encrypt and their cert bot, and it's fairly straightforward to set up and have it make your certificate, and then you're on HTTPS. Now, HTTP2, I was hoping to get a performance boost there. I really didn't. It was a tiny bit faster. GeoPortal is a tiny bit faster, but it wasn't anything to write home about. It was really within the margin of error. Now, GeoPortal was already tuned fairly well, so that probably made a difference, but there wasn't a big performance gain there. But if you're going to HTTPS anyway, HTTP2 with its pipelining and other features, even the compression of the headers and things like that, is, is worth it. To, it's really no problem if you've got HTTPS, you've done all the hard work anyway. Might as well just go to HTTP2. Nothing else will keep you from doing things like having a.tiles.server and b.tiles.server and all that kind of stuff because you won't hit that uh, simultaneous request to the same domain limit as you do under HTTP1. So that HTTP2 helped a very tiny bit, but going to HTTPS was the big thing. Now, at this point, GeoPortal was over 700 kilobytes, so I wanted to get that size down, and my goal was 500 kilobytes. Now, tossing stuff out got it down to about 567 kilobytes, and I tossed out some a few libraries, like I was using Axios, so in, instead of that, I just switched to using Fetch with a Fetch polyfill, and it's smaller. There are some things like that that saved a little bit. What saved the most was throwing out things from my uh, theme component framework, which is Material Design Lite, that I wasn't using. So that was taking a lot of space. There's a lot of JavaScript. It turns out I could throw out every last bit of it. 
and there was a lot of CSS I was using. When I started, I think I had like several thousand CSS classes that were never used by the page. So throwing all that out saved quite a bit. Uh, Bootstrap 3, if you're using Bootstrap, it'll let you build just the components you need to save you space. But I think in the future what I'll do is just do all that CSS by hand and not use a framework. I did another site for one of our projects, Livable Mac, and it wasn't really GIS at all. So I entertained myself by learning Jekyll more than I had and making all the CSS by scratch. And it turns out making a nice looking functional mobile first CSS website is really not that bad. And you end up with a much tinier uh, bit of code coming down the wire. The next thing I did to decrease size was getting rid of uh, the fonts I was loading. I was loading Roboto as the font to use, and I was loading the Material Design Icon font file. And that was a lot of space. What I'm doing now instead is for regular fonts, I'm just using system fonts. And this is the new hot thing to do right now. And you're basically just giving it a list of fonts that systems commonly use from Apple to Windows to Linux to what have you. Yeah, Android. So that's what I'm doing now and everything still looks great. I'm just not having to load that Roboto. And for the the material design icons, that was like a 20 to 30 kilobyte file. I just use Fontello to build just the icons I need. So there's only 20, 20 characters in that font file. And that saved a lot of space for a lot too. Now it's about eight kilobytes instead of 20 to 30 for that one font. So that got me down to about 567 kilobytes, uh, which is better, but it could still be even better than that. So the next thing I did, which really saved the most, was a bunch of image tricks. Now, this site doesn't have a whole lot of images, but this big one right here was like over 100 kilobytes. Um, is a PNG, so I shrank it and run a bunch of stuff on it and got to about 60. But the original file is an SVG made in Inkscape, and I decided to try it. Now, after it goes through its F SVG optimization stuff, it's about 120 kilobytes, which is twice as big as the PNG. But since SVG is text, it gzips over the wire. It ended up only being like 9 or 10 kilobytes over the wire. So that was a savings of almost 100 kilobytes right there. I did the same with this image up here. The next thing I did was I, I was using Fontello for these icons, but loading a font is in your CSS is like a blocking request, so things get held up, and it's another file it has to get. What I did instead is I converted that font to uh, an SVG icon file and I inlined it. CSS Tricks has a good article on, on inline SVG versus icon fonts. Uh, uh, Mr. Coyers is really into inline SVG and Mr. Coyers is a powerful smart. So I tried that. What that looks like is in my uh, index.html I will have I have this SVG that's set not to draw uh, and inside of it I have a bunch of symbols and each one is one of these icons. So then when I need to reference that out in the web page I just say here's my SVG and I'll say use that particular symbol. And this is really cool for a couple reasons. One, it saves you space. Two, it's not another blocking request. And three, because SVG, inline SVG is stylable, 
you can change the colors uh, and size of of the SVG icons just the way you would a font icon. So doing all of that, uh, it's now went from 700 to 567. Now this page right here is 396 kilobytes, which is way below my 500 threshold. I'm very happy with that. So that was getting all the size down other performance things I did and this is this is more about uh, what you call perceptual performance uh, because how a user perceives performance can be very different than the actual performance one thing I had with GeoPortal is this search is a view component and this area right here is a view component so when the page loaded, those would be blank, and then view would have to fill those in the, with those components. Now, inside those components, like here's the search component, I just pasted in what the first render of that component looks like. So when view, so when the page starts loading, the search stuff is there, and then when the view component loads, it just replaces it with the exact same thing and the user is none the wiser. So that makes the perceptual performance quite a bit better. The next thing I did was preloading. Preloading is kind of neat. Here's see some preloading links here. Take for example your JavaScript. Your JavaScript, to do it right, you put it at the very bottom of your document so everything has to happen first, and then it starts loading your JavaScript. What preload tells the browser is, go ahead and start loading that script right from the beginning, as soon as this head is parsed, but don't apply it or don't make it blocking right then, you're just fetching it. So then when I have my actual script tag at the bottom, that resource has already been fetched or already was in the process of being fetched. So if you look at your waterfall, all those fetching of resources that used to kind of spread out are all shifted over to the left very early on in the page load. That speeds things up uh, both in terms of performance and in terms of perception of performance. And I'm doing that with the JavaScript and a couple of the images that are used on the main page. That's preloading. Next thing I did, progressive web app. Progressive web app is a combination of a couple things. You need a manifest file and a service worker and it all has to be going over HTTPS. Now your manifest file is, is fairly easy. You reference that in your index.html or your HTML page. It's just a little bit of JSON with some icons and a little bit of information. Now your service worker, my fear before I got into this was that since browser support was so bad, I was, I was to use this, you'd be splitting your app up into two different code paths and all the mess that entails. That's not the case at all. You basically, in your when your page loads, you say if service worker is available, register it. And that service worker file can be completely empty. It just needs to be a file. And that'll register it as a service worker that will get users prompt to install. But the next thing I did is I used a library Google, Google made called SW Precache. It's a node module. Uh, very straightforward. You just point it at your, your public folder and say precache that stuff. And that will generate a service worker file that will precache all of your resources. And that makes this page, you notice if I refresh it, it's like the map blinks. But every, nothing else looks like it loaded at all. Because the service worker has all of those resources, it loads pretty much instantaneously, particularly on mobile. It will also, on mobile, if they have no network connection, let's see if I can simulate this application boop, boop. offline. You see, I'm totally offline right now, and the page still loads. Now, it doesn't actually work, so I give them this message saying you're offline. 
Like I, I'm not pre-caching our 500,000 addresses they can search for. But uh, it still loads. It's much better than the dinosaur. And the result of all that is this. Ta-da! Almost all 100s on Lighthouse uh, testing. Lighthouse uh, tester is not just for PWA stuff. It does accessibility and some other things. It's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, performance is at 96, and I just can't get it any higher. I've tried above the fold CSS, which is a big pain in the ass, so I'm not doing that anymore. I've tried putting the CSS at the bottom just as an experiment, so that's not blocking at all. And I think it only went up to 97. That performance isn't getting to 100, which bummed me out until I looked at the hacker... You might have seen there's a to-do thing for different frameworks making a to-do list. There's a hacker news reader that the various frameworks have and all of their lighthouse scores for all the various frameworks are lower than mine. So I'm taking that 196 in the hundreds and I'm extremely happy. So that's every... Oh, one other thing I did for mobile to make mobile faster. On mobile, loading a GL map is hard. It, uh, it takes a while. Particularly if you have a slower Android phone like me. Well, let's get back on the network here. So on mobile, the map is optional. In this particular app, the map is, is an extra goodie. It's not really essential. The data that you're finding is the essential part. So it makes the map an optional load. That makes performance loading even over even over 3G, it's three seconds or less now. And it's 238 kilobytes, which is awesome. And I have to give credit for uh, to SimpliCity, which Asheville did, which is open source and it's really awesome. Even for their desktop site, when you do a search and look at property information or anything else, the map view is optional. They don't load that by default. And that makes performance streaming fast. And I hate to tell all my GIS brethren, the map isn't always the most important thing. So that's everything I did in terms of performance. Uh, desktop page is down under 400 kilobytes. Mobile is 238 kilobytes. It's a progressive web app now. Uh, the perceptual loading and the actual loading is very, very fast. So it is as good as I can make it, and I think that's where the performance journey ends. I don't think I'm getting higher than a 96 on Lighthouse, but a 96 is really damn good. So lessons learned. Uh, I would basically do everything I tried again except for the above the fold CSS because that's a giant pain in the ass and it really didn't do a whole lot for me. Uh, the most, in terms of size, my work with fonts and images were the biggest savings. In terms of performance on your screen, uh, the big things were, besides the, the size savings, uh, getting rid of fonts was a big thing, but having the content of the components in the components so when it loads, it's not a white space and then all your JavaScript has to be load, loaded and processed and then it fills those in makes the perception of performance much, much better. Preloading also had an effect on the JavaScript performance as well. So those were the big things. Progressive web apps, uh, I went from thinking uh, this looks like a really complicated thing that won't work on most browsers, it's going to mess up my life, to being it's super simple to do and it gives you a lot of benefits. I think those are my conclusions. Uh, it's been fun. GeoPortal is completely open source, so you can go look at the code, look at uh, you know the build process and tools and see how it all works. And I hope you enjoy that. Bye-bye.